Welcome, welcome. It's a, it's a joy to be here today with you. I know it's really hot outside, and so um, I'm not, I know most of us aren't looking forward to that, but uh, we're glad you're all here today. And so um, today's scripture reading for the call to worship comes from Ephesians 2, um, 4 through 7, and this is what it says. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in, in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. If you look at the chapter before in Ephesians 1, it talks about us being adopted into sonship. And if we read in here, and it says we have been raised up with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly realm. So we've been adopted into his um, heavenly realm. So with that, let's pray. Lord, we lift up you this morning, Lord, and give you praise. You alone are worthy, and we are truly blessed because you are rich in mercy. We know we don't deserve your mercy, and yet you still have expressed your kindness to us in your son, Christ Jesus. Help us to recognize your grace and mercy each day. Be with Hogop and Luther as they deliver your message. May our hearts ear, and ears be opened to hear your words today. Lord, we love you, and may we glorify your name every day as we share your love with others. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Oh, man. I'm sorry. Um, all right. Thank you, Paul David. Let's stand and worship together. We may have done this a couple times. Uh, it, might, it might be new to you. So uh, sing a new song, right? Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn. Is he 
worthy of our praise? Amen. Amen. Lord, you're great, you're powerful, and uh, I just want to take um, a few seconds, and I want us to just not talk, not pray, just let's take a few seconds to listen to what the Lord has to say. I think um, sometimes when we pray, we think we always have to talk because God has nothing to say. And if we don't talk, God won't say anything. But maybe we need to just be quiet sometimes. Hmm? Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart. I'm 
grown to leave the God I love. Here's grace. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Have a seat. Thank you, worship team. So Jesus said in uh, Mark 1, 14 through 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repenting means changing our minds and our attitudes away from self-righteousness and towards godly righteousness. So as we say this together during our time of repentance, let it remind you that we need to repent of our ways and our actions and trust in him. So let's, let's say this together. Almighty God, whose beloved Son came not to be served or for joy, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for sin. Forgive our sin. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it as the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and reconciled to God. All right, the children can come up for the children's message. If I go too long, my son's going to give me the ah. Hi, how's everybody doing? Guess what we're going to talk about today? Money, money, money. What do I have here? What is it? Money. Oh, everybody likes money. Say, do you guys do any chores where you, you get paid for anything or get allowance? Anybody get an allowance? You know what an allowance is? That means when you do something, mommy or daddy gives you a little money. Do you get something? What do you get? Oh, well, at least it's not money, okay? <laughs> well, you know, everything these days comes with a price tag. That means we have to pay for everything. So I'm gonna, we're going to play a game today. And we're going to see whether... Um, of money on these bags match what's inside okay so let's see we'll go with let's go with this one first this one says what does it say on there $25 let's see if what's in here is $25 worth $25 you tell me okay kids oh my gosh what is this a cow a squishy cow Not, you want to feel it Okay, no, no, no feeling. You know what? This cow's not big enough to even give milk. So I don't think that's worth anything. Oh, there's something else in here. A star. You want to feel a star? Okay. Okay. Do you think that's worth $25? No, I don't either. Well, we should, maybe we'll put it in the dollar bag later, okay? Let's see. We're going to go with, let's see. We're going to go with, let's see what's in this one. Oh, my gosh. This one's $10. Do you think there's something good in there for $10? Oh, I think so, too. So let me take it out and see what it is. Yeah, well, you're going to have to wait, okay? It's a card. Well, there's nothing to feel. It says gifts and talents? Does that cost anything? I've never paid. Have you paid for gifts and talents? No. Okay, well, this is kind of ridiculous. I don't get that one. So let's put that away. And we've got two more. Let's go to the next one. Ah, uh, $50. There's got to be something cool for $50. What is this? Oh, a little bear. 
But why would you have a, okay, quickly, that's it, okay, one more feel. No, not now, after, okay? So, we have a little bear, and it's got a heart on it. This must have been from some leftover Valentine's gift. Let's see, oh, there's something else in there for $50. A button? That's a big button. I wonder if it's for a big guy, it must be at least 20 feet tall to have a button like this, huh? Okay, what do you think? Do you think that's worth $50? Oh, nah. oh now let's go to this one, a dollar. One dollar. Now that should be easy. That should be really easy. Let's see what's in here. Oh, another card. It says time. What does that got to do with anything? Time? Oh, that is just doesn't make any sense. Well, I'll tell you something. Whether or not you do have to pay for things. And you know, when Jesus was on earth, he even had to pay for things. And everybody around him had to pay for things. But he tells the story of many parables. And you've heard some of them so far in church. So there was this guy that um, he had to go and collect from the people that owed money. But it, they couldn't pay it all. So what did he do? He told them, that's ah, okay. Just pay half. Or pay a third. It's okay. You know. Um, it's okay, no problem. And he would tell his manager, and the manager would say, oh, okay. Now, I think God would say, we don't want to get too caught up with money. Do you think money is really that important? No, because I said something about time and talents. Now, one thing I'm going to tell you about money, money, you know what is money? Money is just paper, right? Money is just paper, like this dollar. It's just paper. So I just threw it away. It fades away. Um, give, it, give, that, give that to that nice, handsome gentleman over there. Get to keep it. Okay, okay. Sit, sit. Okay, out of control, kids. All right. Okay. But God wants us to use our money wisely. Now, what do you think we could use our money for? What about helping somebody? Food? What about what God, what do you think God would want you to do with the money? What do you think? Go ahead. That's a good idea, to help somebody. What about here at church? What could you do with the money here? Yeah, if we give money to the church, you know what that does? That helps God continue his ministry here in our, in our church. And you know what this is all called? This is called, it's a big word, stewardship. And stewardship means that we're going to make wise use of our money. And But the other thing is, you saw those cards that said abilities and time. Kids, what else could you do with your time? Anybody want to tell you what you can do with your time? You got a boo-boo? Okay. <laughs> well, God wants us to do things with our time and our talents. And we want to do things for the church, like volunteer um, to help somebody, join the choir, do a project for somebody, okay? Go to Armenia. That would be cool, maybe when you get older. But the most important thing of all of this that we've said, nothing should come between money and God. Okay? That's the important thing. The most important thing is what God tells us to do with our money. I want to close with a verse that comes from Matthew. It says, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters Either one will hate one and, he, and love the other, or he will be devoted to the, and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Everybody, let's pray, okay? Dear God, thank you for all your many blessings, and we praise you for your world and for our time, our talents, and our treasures. Please help us to use them wisely and to glorify you with all that we have. Let nothing come between us and you, dear God. Thank you for your love. 
We love you. Thank you for thank you for Jesus. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, time to go to Sunday school. Oh, I have one more thing. Okay, a dollar. Now I want you to take a dollar and I want you to use it wisely. Give it to your mommy and daddy. You get one dollar. One dollar. One dollar for me. Money isn't the main thing. No, he can come get it. Let him come get it. Okay, go, go, go. If you got a dollar, go. No, you don't grab. Okay, thank you. All right, th thank you, Mom, for that lovely message. <laughs> Next time we'll get you uh, the money gun and you can just shoot it out like that. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm, I'm Paul Bedrosia, one of the elders here. Good morning again. <laughs> so uh, we have some invitations for you. So Camp Otter is having a groundbreaking August 5th. Um, if you'd like to go, um, there was a bus that was taking people, but that bus is now full in case you were um, counting on that. So we wanted to let you know that. <clears throat> family camp. So who's going to family camp? Raise your hand. You guys got to sign up for family camp. It's going to be a great time. Um, it was wonderful last year, and um, we're going to have a great time this year. So please sign up. It is um, towards the end of the month, I mean, end of August. I think it's the 27th and 28th, I think. And um, we're going to meet Bodily Greg there. So he's going to be coming back that Sunday or that, that weekend. Um, the next thing we have is... Pilgrim is having their VBS, and it's a joint VBS between with us and them. And so if you'd like to attend, I think you can register online. The last thing is, um, yesterday in the mail, I got a nice um, um, paper that, sh that talked about the, the Armenian mission trip, and it gave a nice highlight of all the things that they did over there. And so next Sunday after church on the 30th, um, in the fireside room, we're going to have a light lunch, and they're going to tell us about the trip and, and let us ask some questions and things like that. So if you're interested in going to that, it's next Sunday after church. Thank you. Thank you, Paul David. Well, I guess we are going to sing. Um, there says, you want to join us? We're, gonna, we're, we're the choir today, and we're going to sing uh, with you guys. This is my father's world. It's going to be up on the projector or the red hymnal number 281. This is my father's word. Yeah. 
Now we've come to our time of asking and yielding. And so these are some of the things that we need to be in prayer for, for our congregation and friends and family. So uh, we need to continue to pray for Sosi uh, Hartunian. Her mother went to be with the Lord. And so um, keep her and Bodvili in your prayers. Um, we also need to be in prayer for the Kirkesian family, Hago Kirkesian. He passed away. Um, and so about a week or so ago, it was his funeral. Um, and then Jerry Baker's son, who passed away unexpectedly. Um, we also want to be in prayer for uh, Eva Shahanian, who went to be with the Lord on the 10th of uh, July. We also want to pray for Hago Tutigian um, for healing. He fell and broke his leg. So, yeah, so we need to be in prayer for that. And then Dennis Kevorkian for healing for his eye. He had eye surgery. And so he, he, we need to be in prayer for him. As well as Camp Otto. All the kids are at camp right now. And, and they'll be there this week and probably next week. And so we just want to pray for them. Um, that the Lord is, is speaking to them. And then also continue to pray for the senior pastor of the Evangelical Churches of Armenia. Reverend Hovanes Hovasepian. And keep Pastor Greg or Bible really Greg in your, in your prayers as well as he's on his sabbatical. So... Yeah, so let's, let's take time to pray. Um, Heavenly Father, you are a merciful God, Lord, uh, one who answers prayers. And so we come to you bringing our prayers and our concerns to you uh, because we know you hear us and you, you tell us, you ask us to, to talk to you each day. And so that's what we're doing. We're coming to you and bringing you all the concerns that we have um, and the needs for others. And so we pray for Sosi Hartunian, um, for the passing of her mother, Lord. We pray that you give her comfort, um, that she remain strong in you, Lord, that you'd give her courage each day. And so we just continue to pray for her. We pray for the family, the, the Carcassian family, Lord, as they mourn the loss of Hagop, Lord. Pray that you bring them comfort as well, um, and that, that um, they continue to put their trust and faith in you, Lord, um, that you're in control of all things. We pray for that. We pray for the Thurbers too, at the loss of their their grandfather. I forgot to mention that, Lord. And so we just pray for them. Pray that you continue to um, bring healing to their family, Lord, at at that loss, Lord. I know it's difficult. Um, and we pray for Jerry Baker and for Nelda and for for the, the passing of Jerry's son, Lord. Pray that you continue to bring them comfort as well. Um, I know it's a difficult thing that no one can imagine I'm losing a child Lord and so um, we just we just pray that you uh, would bring them peace Lord and we pray for Hagop Tutikian um, that he would be healed from his fall Lord that you would heal his leg Lord that he'd be able to walk again um, be with him um, as he rests and recovers Lord and we pray for the family of Eva Shahinian um, that you bring them comfort Lord um, at the passing of her, Lord. Uh, that's, that's, so many people are passing, Lord, and so we just pray for, for your love um, to be felt, Lord. We also pray for Dennis Kevorkian, Lord, that you would heal his eye, um, that he'd be able to see that there'd be no complications, Lord, um, in, in that surgery. We also pray for Camp Audiv, Pray for the children that are there, Lord, um, that, that their hearts would be open to you um, and to your word, Lord, uh, that they would, they would have a, a desire to hear your word, Lord, 
um, speak to them, Father. We pray for the senior pastor of the Evangelical Churches of Armenia, Lord, Reverend Hovanes Hovisepian, Lord. Pray that you give him guidance, you give him wisdom, courage as he leads the church, Lord. Um, pray, for, pray for strength for him. And finally, pray for Badvali Greg, Lord. Um, we pray that you'd give him continued rest, renewal, Lord, um, that he would be hearing your, your voice, Lord, as he is resting, Lord, and, and ready to come back um, to teach us um, what, you're, what you are asking him to do, Lord. So we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The Armenian scripture read, oh yeah. Pari Luis. I saw the video of the Avedaranas Lugasi, Das Neveter or Kalukan, Arachin, Minchev Iner or Tamar Nere. Ir Asha Gert Nerun al Asav. Harust Mart Magar, Worden Desma Uner. Անոր վրա քանքատ եղավ իրեն, որբեսի թե իր ունեցածը գփջացնե։ Ուստի գանչեց սանիգա ու սավ անոր, ինչ է այս, որ քեզի համար գլսեմ, քու դնդեսությանը թհաշի վդուր, բասնձի ալ չես կրնար դնդեսը լալ։ Դնդեսը � Հողա քործություն չեմ գրնարնել, մուրալու գամջնամ։ Կիտեմ ինչ պիտի ընեմ։ Որբեսի, երբ ին դնդեսությունս հանվիմ, զիս իրենց դունը ընդունին, իր դիրոչը պարդագանները մեկիք մեկիք իրեն գանչելով ասավ առաջին Ասավ անոր կիրըտ ար ու շուտով նստե հիսունքր է։ Ետ գմյուսին ասավ թուն որ չապ պարտկունիս, անիկա ասավ հայրուր կոր ծորեն։ Ասավ անոր կիրըտ ար և ուծունքր է։ Դերը անիրավ դնդեսը կովեց, որ խելացիություն ըրավ Ես ալ ծեզի գսեմ, անիրավ մամոնայեն ծեզի պարեգամներ էրեք, որբեսի երբ անիկա բակսի ծեզ հավիտենագան պնագարաններուն մեջ ընդունվին։ Դերը որդներ սուրպ խոսկին ընթերցումը։ Good morning, Church. Merder Jesus Christosi, Padvagana Anov, Gochunem says, we have Paregazek de Rochiduna, or Miastapar Irieres Pendrink. I serve a new tene, inch pesk garoganank, Mertram a corzazel, surkrain, sevo. Azohoska, shat met stergadaraze in Gianki Smith, sorves nelu, te inch pesker nam parid and desma lal իր տրամին վրա։ Թրամագան գարիք է գրնա ժնշումներ պանեցնել մեր գյանքի մեջ։ Ընդանիքիտ նյութագան հայտայթելը գրնա մդահոգություն բատջարել, մդազել դալով թե պավարար տրամ ունիմ որավահագիս համար և զախսերուս համար և Առաջ պետք է խնդրենք ասսո թակավորությունը և անոր արդարությունը և այդ պոլոր պաները մեզի բիտի դրվին, մարջոս 6-33։ Առավել իմասություն է թրամագան ահակահոտյուն չուն են ալ, թնելով թրամասիրությունը � Եպ պրայցիս տասներեք ինգով Հիսուս սավ, պնավ կեզի բիտի չտողում ու կեզ երեսե բիտի չտսկեմ։ 
Azzo havidan ragan dergayatçuna havadasyanlerun hede. Anşut şat havadasyanler gan boronk tramagan negutyan meçen ansan payts anonk havatki desagedov bagasçunet san yerpek. Asfadan şi meç tarabim masin aveli hamarner gan kante yerginki masin. Ureman menk Betke asuzo nütagani vera peryal ıskıstuk nere korzazen mergiyanki orva polor barakanerun meç. Xohem yeğir kuş hazet aveli mi zahser. Harmarir kun ergayi nütagani vijagit. Aragaz kısammek kısangıse imastunin pınagaranin meç şat kans yev yuga. Payts ammit martı իր ունեցածը գգլ է խնայեն նյութական նյութական օրը նեղության օրվան համար իմաստյուն է թրամդ կորսնել որբեսի փազոն պատկես թրամդ իմաստյամ զախս է եւ շրայլություն մի են էր ոգաստաս Ուստի Հիսուս սավ անոնց աբրիս բարի եւ հավադարին զարա Մաթեոս 20:21 Նախ կան դրամը դիկոր սնես փնդրե իմաստուն խորհրդադու որուն խորհրդը գա համապատասխան է աստծո խոսքին հետ Սակայն առաջին հերթին ներծումը է աստծո դան քու դասանորդովը մա կա 3 դասը գսե Polor dasanortnere kansanun kansadunu darek borbesi danos meç başarla yev asov zis portetsek kese zoratsdera yegrort asvaz gev datsvos 25 kılxun 23 hamari meç kese yergira imse asvaz beşnagan diragan ne amen pani payts am mez veragatsu tradze vordev an mez stezadze irdman tiana bes Joğovoğlu das mek yergu gese ku nertrum neret zanazan marzeru mechtir nertrum re yergan jamanagi amar borons meyen anşar galbasnere sagayn mardahara vermaga yete mer getrunatsun mian la dramatrutune mer trama gar kavrelu mech an jamanak mer askerem vidi vribi asuzo nergayetuna Hedef apar, aveli kit jamanak bidi dramatrenk asuzo yev mer ndanikin. Naev, mer meng nertrum betge enenk veri paneru hamar. Aysinkan, kanser tizel yergin kimeç, matyos vets kısan. Kanser sırdin het gapbadze, mer sırdere inci gıpapakin. Artyok, aşkari panere garje kavores, aysinkan, Tram hampav statsvats abahavutyun zorutyun yev astetsutyun gamte kusirdat hisusi gapapaki vorbest ku mezakuin kanset hima yev havedagantyan hamar matyos vetsk samek kse kanzi tser kans ur vore tser sirnal homidella khohem ndanikma Նվազակույն երկու անցեր պետք է որոշե, որոնք քիդագից են նյութական գարավարելու եւ առողջ հարաբերություն ունեն թրամի նկատմամբ։ Երբ տան մեջ թրամի վերագացուն գփացակայի, ան ժամանակ երկրորդ անցը հանց ընդգրկն է ընդանեկի նյութական պետքերը առանց ընդհանումի։ Ասված գանգալե իր զավակներեն, որոնք անգերզլան իրենց թրամական կորզնեն նեյություններում մեջ անգորտն է անոնց որոն նյութականը գշահին անգերծ աշխատանքով քան թե մեղավոր միջոցներով արագած 13-11 ասված գիգան չէ մեր մեր բարդկերը վճարելու եւ ուրիշներուն իրավունները հադուցանելու հագոփու 5 4 6 մենք մենք պետք է լանգ բարդաճանաչ մեր դրամը գարավարելու արագած 13 16 գսե բարդաճանած անսիմը զրակիրները պիտի փարկավաջին դրամ խնայելը 
մեզիկ բադրաստ է հետակայի նիտական հաչողություններու առագած 30-25-25. Նաև մասնահադուկ ծախսերու համար թրամ մեկ կոմ թնելը իմաստություն է, բողոս առակյալը գսե առաջին գորնթացիս դասվեց երուկի մեջ, ամեն մեկ շապտի որը ծեզմ է ամեն մեկը իրքով թողթիզ է ինչ որ գահաչողի, որ չլլատ է երբ կամ այն ադեն ժողովումները լան։ Ասված ինչ կսե պարի դնդեսմը լալու նգատմամբ, ուղաս տասվեց � Ասպած գահաջի իր զավակներեն երբ անոնք պարի դնդեսներ գլլան։ Մատյոս 6-24 սկս է, մարդ մչը գրնար երկու դերոտ զարայել, գամ մեկը բիտցիր է և մյուս ադ է, գամ մեկում բետ գիհարի ու մյուսին առամար է, չեք գրնար թե Երբ ուրիշ դերոշ մը գծարայինք, այսինքը թրամը, ասզո մերը ստեղծելուն նբադագային գխողնանք, նաև բիդի անդեսենք զասված մեզարել է։ Ուստի, ինչպես գրնանք զասված պարավորել մեր նիտագավոնովը, մեր նի� Այս համարը մեզ գկաճալեր է, աստոն նախաբադի վնել նույնիսկ մեր նութագանով ալ։ Արադացեր նլալը թրամի ուժին ասեսյունը գգոդր է մեր վրայեն։ Եգորդ գորնթացիս ինի յոթը գսե, ամեն մեկը ինչպես իր սրդովը � Եգրորդ, պետք է խուսապինք բարդք է, վջարելով մեր բարդկերը ամեն աշուտ ճամանագամիչոցին մեջ։ Առագած 27-ը գսե, հարուստը աղկատներում վրա գիշխ է, պոխ արնողը պոխ տվողին ծարագլլա։ Հագոպուտ 4-13 մինչ անդեսելով ասսո գամպնը ու նպատագը։ Նդագարագը բետք է հետևյալ միտք ու ունենանք։ Եթե դերը գամենա ու աբրինք, այս կամ այն պանը բետք է ենենք։ Երորդը գողոսացիս 3-23 կսե, ինչ որ գնեք սրդացրեք Ներարյալ մեր տրամով գբահան չէ գարկաբահություն, հարադեվություն և շնորկ։ Վերջապես, երբ հաչողինք պարի դնդեսմը լալ է, բողոս առակյալ հետևյալ խրադը գուդա։ Աս աշխարի վրա հարուստի է ոներուն բատվեր դուր, որ որ ամեն պամ մեզի առատ որենք ու դա վայելելու։ Առաջին դիմետյոց բեծ դասնիոթը։ Ամեն։ Ես ու ստան տա սինգ դա հայատ մեր, ու 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 singing those, song, uh, the, those words to God.
Parkaitun, Yev Zorutun, Yev Park, Havidianus, Havidenitz, Amen. Good morning, church. The scripture lesson today is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 1 through 9. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give me an account of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first one, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 400. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He said to him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had settled, he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than they are with the people of the light. I tell you this, Use worldly wealth to gain your friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal blessing, eternal dwelling. That's the word of the Lord. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Let let us pray. Lord, let my words be your words and my thoughts your thoughts, Lord. Lord, I sincerely pray that that, that everyone here see you and not me. Open our hearts and our minds to understand your message today. Amen. So before Bodily Greg went on his sabbatical, he selected a series of parables to be the sermons for while he was gone. We've had the pleasure of hearing some great sermons based on these parables and these passages. And I think that most of us enjoy hearing Jesus' parables because they're stories and illustrations that can really drive a point home. We heard about the wise and foolish builder One built on the rock, one built on the sand. And then when the storm came, we know what happened. The one that built on sand was gone, which taught us to build our lives upon the word of the Lord. We learned how to be a true neighbor in the story of the Samaritan. When asked who is the true neighbor, we see that the the Samaritan who treated his enemy with care, who sacrificed himself to care for his enemy, was the true neighbor and that we are called to do the same. We studied the lost sheep and the prodigal son, showing the importance of seeking the lost and returning to the Lord. Last week, Badvili Aremba Durian showed us the importance of freely using our resources for the kingdom of God in the limited time that we have, because at any moment, God can take us home. In the example of the rich fool. Each of these stories It is clear who the good and bad examples are. We know who the good guys are and the bad guys are. We just read them. These passages even call them out. For the good, they say the good, the wise. For the bad, they say the fool, the unwise, the unmerciful. So it's obvious in those passages who the heroes are, who we should try to be like, and who we should try not to be like. We see examples in the Samaritan, the father of the prodigal son, the shepherd chasing after his sheep. We want to be like them. We see examples in the Levite and the priest that ignored the injured man, the prodigal son himself, people that we should not be like, the fool. 
As you heard this parable read to you, as, as Richard read to us, I hope you realize this example is a little different. The hero doesn't make sense. The message seems contradictory. Even the title, Dishonest Manager, can set you up for an ending that you didn't expect. I don't know why Greg gave this passage to me. As I reviewed the list before his departure and asked him about my assignment, he said, yeah, that's one of the hardest parables to interpret, but you like a challenge, right? <laughs> I think this was more likely a subconscious way of him getting back at me for all the difficulties I gave him as a junior high and high schooler in his youth group. This is his revenge. <laughs> for the last two months, I've been thinking, reading, praying, and discussing this passage to help understand its meaning. Before we jump into the passage, I want to spend a little time understanding why Christ spoke in parables. While we may believe parables are a great way to explain a complex, complicated concept, that's actually not consistent with what Christ's explanation of why he spoke in parables. If we look at Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 to 16, the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And he explains that this is a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 6. You will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. So according to Christ, parables are actually a way of hiding the truth from those who are not yet prepared to receive it. A parable is like a two-sided coin. On the one hand, a parable can help us better understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven through a story. They can be a tool which, along with the assistance of the Holy Spirit, can reveal key and complex spiritual concepts. On the opposite hand, a parable hides the secrets of the kingdom from those who have not yet committed themselves to his lordship. Parables allow those who have faith, along with the instruction of the Holy Spirit, to learn about the kingdom. And they prevent others from doing the same. Those without the faith and without the spirit are unable to understand the truths of Jesus' parables. And this is a result of both one's own rejection of Christ's message and a divine blinding on account of their sin. If we think of an example of this, think of Pharaoh where God hardened Pharaoh's heart even more. And that's what this is. So it's not unusual to encounter a parable that is hard to understand. Now that we understand the purpose of parables, we need to understand how to interpret them. There are two key elements that we need to keep in mind. The first is that every parable typically has one key point or purpose. As we're reading the parable, we must focus our minds to identify that key point. The second is that we can't take everything in a parable at face value. A parable is not an allegory. Everything in a parable does not necessarily have a symbolic meaning. It is a story to emphasize a key point. We can't take every line by itself and look for meaning within it, but instead we must look to the story as a whole and try with the Holy Spirit to understand what Christ's point was in that parable. So why did I spend time to review our understanding of parables? Seems like I've gone back. We've done parables for so long, and I'm jumping back to the beginning. Well, it's because on the surface, the parable we are studying today appears that the dishonest behavior is being praised. This does not make sense. Not knowing that parables may be purposefully confusing and may only have one central meaning, we realize that we cannot infer that God is asking us to be dishonest or unethical. We have to look deeper. So let's look at the story. I'm going to go line by line through the story to, to kind of re rehash and reiterate what's going on. So it starts off simply enough. There was a rich man who had a manager. So there was a person who was very rich, and, and he hired a manager to oversee his assets. Back then, very wealthy families or people would hire people like this, and it happens now as well. I'm sure some of you have financial advisors or financial managers, possibly property managers, stockbrokers, and so on, and these people are hired to manage your assets. The difference is back then you would hire one person who would manage all of your assets and they would oversee it all and they would essentially speak in your place. 
An example today may be like some of the very wealthy or those movie stars that have people that do everything for them. That's sort of what this was. And this manager would essentially speak on the master's behalf. So whatever they did or said was what went. It continues to say, and charges were brought to him, the rich man, that this man was wasting his possessions. So the manager has not been managing the uh, manager's assets appropriately. Even worse, he's probably been wasting or misusing or even stealing the assets that have been entrusted to him. We don't know exactly what he'd been doing, but it was apparent to others that he was doing something wrong, and they were reporting this to the master. The term used to describe this mismanagement is the same term used to describe the squandering of the, uh, of the money by the prodigal son in chapter 15. This manager was squandering the master's money. So, it goes on to say, and he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. The master has now accused the manager of wrongdoing and is going to review the accounts for himself. He has committed to firing the manager. This isn't going to be a trial. There isn't going to be an appeal. There isn't going to be a plan of correction, if you've ever heard of that. The manager is being relieved of his duties. So, up to this point, nothing confusing. Clearly the manager is our bad guy. We can keep reading to see what happens next. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? The manager is not denying that he did anything wrong or mismanaged the assets, but he must decide what to do now. The t- he has very little time to prepare for what happens because he's, all these assets are going to be taken from him and he won't have the master's resources anymore. He goes on to say, I am not strong enough to dig and I am ashamed to beg. So in this elite position that he's had, he's lost the ability to work. And he's lost the ability to make any finances for himself. So he needs to find a way to care for himself. He knows his limitations. And he knows that once this title is taken away, he will not survive. So far, so good? Or as B.T. Lewis would say, y'all with me? (laughs) I have decided, he goes on to say, I have decided what to do. So that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So the manager has come up with a plan. He's going to protect his future. He's going to try and create a safety net for him by creating relationships or gaining favor from other people. He's going to have an alternative, a backup plan. And think about it, This happens today. If an employee knows that they're about to be fired or is not doing a well job, they may make arrangements to find another job before they're let go or so that when they're let go, they have somewhere to go. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 400. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill, make it 800. His plan was to ingratiate himself to the debtors so that by helping them, they'll remember and when he's out of a job, may give him a job. He's hoping to forgive some or a large part of their debt so that in a you scratch my back, I scratch your back fashion, he'll have some help in his time of need. These are large amounts. In terms of the oil, the amount of oil that was owed was about three years' wages. And the amount of wheat that was owed was about nine years' wages. So these are not small amounts, and these are not small amounts that he's forgiving. They would not go unnoticed. At this point, you should be thinking that the ax is coming. He is stealing from the master for his own benefit, and clearly he'll be punished that this is a lesson about stealing. He'll probably be arrested, stoned, or even worse. We are going to make an example of this guy of what not to do. Not so fast. The manager commended the dishonest, sorry, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. Wait, did I read that right? The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. But isn't this where the manager should get punished, the punishment that's coming to him? Is he being praised? Are we being encouraged to behave similarly in our lives? Okay, maybe I read it too quickly or misunderstood it. Maybe he just forgave a portion, his portion, of what was owed. So if you think about it, the manager takes a commission... And there's some amount that's owed, and he has a commission on that. And maybe he was smart, and he said, you know, to gain favor from my master, I'm going to forgive my commission, 
and say, just pay the master what you owe him and I'll forgive my part. This doesn't make sense to me because if you look, he says, sit down quickly, write down what you owe, the smaller amount. So he's hiding it from the master. He's not showing the master or telling the master, look, I'll give up my portion and get your money. Maybe instead he realized that the master isn't going to get paid at all for any of these debts. Those debts are so big that no one's ever going to pay. So I might as well make them smaller and get a little bit of money instead of getting all the money. That will make my master happy. But we don't see anywhere in the story where he's actually collecting anything. He's just changing what people owe. So I don't think this is a correct interpretation either. All evidence points to the manager misusing the authority he has been given over the master's assets. And in essence, stealing from the master for his own benefit. He was earning favor for himself by giving away someone else's money. Even if this action was not illegal, and it probably wasn't because he was in charge, he could do whatever he wanted, it was clearly unethical. So is Christ supporting unethical behavior here? How can this be the hero of our story? The key here is that the master praised the managers for his shrewdness, not his unethical behavior. Again, I want to say this again. He's being praised for his shrewdness, not his unethical behavior. So not what he did, but the plan. Shrewdness is not necessarily a bad trait. We see in Matthew when the 12 disciples are told to behave shrewdly as they're being sent out to, to preach the message. Matthew 10, chapter 16. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Christ knew the world that he was sending his disciples into, and he wanted them to be prepared, ready to respond to the world in kind. The manager was clever. He came up with a very simple plan to ensure his future financial stability. That is what, be, what is being praised here. Not his action or unethical behavior, but his plan. I am not sure if I would call the manager the hero of the story, but Christ is telling us that there is something about him we need to see and emulate. As we keep reading the passage and Christ's explanation, things get a bit more confusing again. For the, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Here again, he is focusing on being shrewd. He's talking about shrewdness. He's making a comparison between two groups. The sons of this world and the sons of light. Or non-believers and believers. He's saying that people of this world are more clever when dealing with worldly things than people of the light are when dealing with heavenly things. People in this world are very clever when they deal with worldly things. But believers, people of the light, are not that clever or not as clever when dealing with heavenly things. And we can probably expand this to say that even believers may not behave much differently from non-believers when it comes to how to interact, interact with the world. We can tend to be more clever in our dealings with earthly, worldly things than we are with those things that have eternal significance. Let's think about a few examples. Think about how much time and effort we spend focusing on our investments, properties, money, assets, etc. How we're constantly, how we may be looking for that next big thing. If you're investing, what is the next new technology, AI or GPT, what I should be investing my money in? If you're a, a property, invest, if you're investing in property, where is the newest part of town, the newest thing that I should buy? If you're in farming, what should I be planting next year or five years from now? None of this is bad. It is actually good, as Luther said, to be shrewd and wise about our investments. But do we apply the same shrewdness and cleverness to our heavenly commands? And it's not just the big things. If we think about it, even small things. Okay, raise your hand if you're Armenian. Ra keep your hand up if you like a bargain. Okay, I didn't see any hands go down. Great. So I definitely love a bargain. And the amount of time that I may spend trying to get that best deal is definitely one of those shrewd things that we do. So it's not just big things. It's even small things. But he's saying take that energy and apply it to the heavenly things or those which have eternal significance. Do we spend as much time and energy on heavenly matters? Are we as clever with the way in which we approach missions and evangelism? Are we thinking, how can I take this next step or do this next thing as it relates to our church or to spreading the gospel? Do we spend as much time planning how to reach out to our neighbors and families? I think this is a key point of this parable that we must use that same cleverness in eternal endeavors. 
not just worldly matters. Christ ends, or the, the, Christ ends this section with another confusing verse. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. I'm going to read it one more time. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by, by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. So I want to unpack this a little bit. I think there are three key subjects here. The first part, he starts with make friends. Pretty easy. If we think of what the manager gained, what did the manager gain with the use of the master's assets? He gained the favor of those debtors. He gained relationships. He used the master's money to secure relationships for himself. And I believe that is the key point of this parable, to make relationships. Next, it talks about by means of unrighteous wealth. Now, that sounds like it's saying earn your money in unrighteous, unsavory ways and then use it. But if we look at it more closely, I don't think that's what he's talking about here. I think the comparison he's making is unrighteous wealth or assets, money, properties, whatever we have, is all temporary. It is not permanent. Unlike our heavenly wealth or our heavenly reward, our salvation. For that reason, it's considered unrighteous. So use those things that are temporary to win over things for God in the heavenly realm. Everything that here is here on earth will fail. And what will not fail is our salvation and our heavenly rewards. And then finally, so that they may receive you into eternal dwellings. So it's, it's not talking about your salvation for specifically, but it's talking about being received by others who are saved. So unlike our wealth that will one day fail, our salvation will not. And every person whom you connect with and who enters the kingdom of God will be together with you for eternity. That is how important this is to continue spreading the gospel to reach those who do not know the truth. So what is this parable? So, so crazy question. I'm going I'm to blow your minds for a moment. Is this parable saying that we should use our money to buy people? In a way, yes. <laughs> but maybe more accurately, this parable is talking about turning our resources, our earthly temporary resources, into people. Putting relationships ahead of earthly things. I do not believe it is just saying we need to not be greedy and give more. I don't think it's just about giving. There are other parables that cover this topic. The parable last week covered this topic very well. Um, and if we look more closely at this parable, the manager found a clever way, again, talking about shrewdness, to use his master's money to gain favor for himself. Now, where he failed is that he misused the master's funds for his own gain. His intention was himself. He wanted to benefit himself in earthly matters. He was going to reap the reward. We are called, however, to use our master's resources for his good purposes. The favor that we gain is not for ourselves, but is for the Lord. Do not understand me wrong. I am not saying that we need to trick people with money to come to the Lord. I am saying that we need to be clever, wise, shrewd with how we use the resources that God has entrusted us to develop spiritual relationships. In the parable of the prodigal son, we see an example where money was used improperly to create false relationships, which disappeared the moment the money ended. Do you remember that? He had spent all his money on his friends, and when the money was gone, they were gone. That is not what we're talking about here. What does this look like? Maybe this is meeting the need of someone in your life to grow closer to them in friendship. Maybe this is opening your home, your possessions, your dining table to one of your neighbors to spend an evening with them. Maybe this is letting someone borrow your car or another possession of yours. Every situation will be different. But when we freely give to someone else, a relationship starts that may be the first step in their walk towards eternal life. They see the generosity of Christ through you. And this opens the door to get to know you and in turn, Christ better through you. It does not stop there. It's just an opening. So are you using your God-given resources to earn favor from the Lord, uh, for the Lord from others? Are you being clever in looking for every opportunity to make connection with someone? Instead of just sitting back and waiting, are you being jadabig about how you reach the lost? We see that even Paul was shrewd or clever in his dealing with non-believers. In 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23, Paul shows that he, how he dealt with the lost. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. 
To the Jews I become a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. So you see how he was clever and wise in dealing with each person that he came against. I want to bring this closer to home here. With regards to FAPC, I can think of one very specific example. Our mission is to cultivate a community of disciple makers that shares the reconciling love of Christ with Armenians, their families, and neighbors. One of the ways we've been trying to do this through, uh, is through events like the Memorial Day picnic. I've been asked many times, why have we decided to make this event free? Isn't that a, uh, is not that a wise use of our resources? Why can't we just charge a fee or a nominal fee or something? Are we using our resources wise by making this free? Now, I can't say that the event will always be free or that there's no other way to accomplish the same goal if we charge a nominal fee. I will say, however, that at least in these first few years, the fact that the event has been free has opened the door to so many people to come, attend, and get to know this. Know us. I have heard from so many people about their excitement about how open we are, how welcoming we are, how refreshing this event has been for them. I believe this is an example of God's resources being used in a shrewd way to earn the favor of those in our community who may not know the Lord. Now, we can't stop there. It's not just a free meal. We must take the initial relationship and run with it. But if we didn't make the decision to use our resources to initiate that relationship, we wouldn't have the first step. Again, please don't get me wrong. This isn't a trick. We're not trying to use our money to trick people. This isn't like a streaming service subscription like Disney Plus or Netflix where you get the first two weeks free and they hope that you get hooked or forget to cancel your membership and keep paying. That's not what this is. This is a way to open the door to a relationship with someone. This is just one way that we are showing love in a personal way in the hopes of developing a relationship and even more so a discipling relationship with someone. As we leave here today, please pray and meditate on how you can shrewdly use the resources that God has entrusted you, each one of you, in the path to develop eternal relationships. And remember that just like the manager, our time is limited, so we must act quickly. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. Yev hima mer der Jesus Christos is norka, hor asso seva sera. Yev supo kuin hau tachichuna mer aminun heda la. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.